double thumbs up quadruple thumbs up all right well everybody hi again and welcome to our second virtual tasting today we're going to be going over three different grenache wines that we made um, in 2018 and if you want to hear about the 2018 vintage which i spoke about in the last virtual tasting you can go check that out maybe after we're done here so i'm trying to you know keep everything a little bit focused today um, i just want to start out by saying that i tend to speak deliberately and slowly and sometimes my stories can be a little bit long and i noticed last time that my focus was on the storytelling and maybe not as much on tasting the wine. So I just wanted to let you guys know that you are on your schedule at home. You can taste these wines at any time while I'm speaking, go back and forth. It's really cool. I've been sitting here just kind of going through the aroma of the three different wines and um, picking up some subtle differences um, in them. So I don't want you guys to wait for me to start tasting and drinking these wines um, if you are tasting and drinking along. Uh, with the tasting today um, So go ahead and feel free to do that um, as I'm speaking because I have some stories and some other things that I want to get into about Grenache before we get in specifically to the three wines um, And just like last time I want to give a shout out. I actually only have a couple shout outs today but my first one is to Sue and Lowell in uh, Colorado they are the future in-laws of Cassie, our wine club manager. So, hey, Sue and Lowell. Um, also want to give a shout out to my wife. It was her birthday within the last couple of weeks. So happy birthday to Susan. And also a shout out to all the mothers out there. I know it's a few days late, um, but happy Mother's Day to my mom and your moms and everybody's moms out there. So um, Grenache is the subject today, and it's a subject that I really like talking about, actually love talking about. Um, I've actually had people say, wow, Steve, I didn't even know you could talk that much um, after a seminar um, I gave on Grenache a few years ago for the Santa Barbara County Vintners Association. And yeah, I, I really love Grenache. And um, what do I love about Grenache? Well, there's really a couple things. Um, and one is that it gives great pleasure to me and hopefully to those of you who are drink, drinking it out there or have drunk it out there before. Um, I feel like wine should be pleasurable and the wines that we try to make here are hopefully delivering a lot of pleasure to people who are drinking and tasting them. Um, and the other thing I really love about Grenache is its versatility. So here we're going to be doing Grenache on its own as varietal wines, um, but we use Grenache in so many different ways here at the winery. Um, obviously the Grenache Blanc, the white Grenache that we did a couple weeks ago in the tasting. And then we also make a really awesome rosé um, out of Grenache from Parisma. And I think Grenache is to me probably the best variety to use to make a rosé wine out of all of them. Um, and we also use it in a blend, which is very commonly used in blends. Our Cuvée Lebec blend has a lot of Grenache in it, and also our smaller production Barrel Select Cuvée has some Grenache in it as well. So I just think that it is just so user-friendly, and, and it's just a really um, great, great uh, to work with it. I'm so uh, happy about the decisions that we've made um, to over 20 years ago to uh, plant and to grow and really pursue Grenache in Santa Barbara County. Um, we did have a question. I did mention blends and I'm just going to focus on that really quickly and get it out of the way. There's a question about GSM Grenache Syrah Morvedra blends uh, from Ben in Borrego Springs, California. And Ben wants to know what Grenache brings to the party in a GSM blend. And I just thought I'd hit on that really quickly um, before we get into the varietal itself. Um, to me, Grenache brings brightness and it brings lift to a blend. And you might be wondering like, what the heck does that mean? Like lift to a blend. But I have an interesting story to tell um, quickly. Um, last year, I was invited to do a vertical tasting up at Tabas Creek of their high-end Esprit de Beaucastel blend made out of Paso Robles. And um, going back 20 years, they um, didn't use 
you know, in, in the 20 year old, 18 year old vintage, somewhere along the line in year five or six for their blend, they really upped the Grenache percentage in the wine. And that was due to the fact that they had better Grenache clonal material, better grapes coming into their winery. And so they really upped it in the blend and something like that light bulb went off when I was going through those wines again of what it initially went off to me when I, you know, started making and playing with Grenache uh, years and years ago. And that is what it brings. It brings this just lifted quality to the wine. It really elevates everything involved in that blend. It really elevated the quality for sure, but it elevated and brightened up the fruit and focus of the Morved and the Syrah and the Cunois that are a part of that Tabas Cake brand. So that's to me what it brings. That's what I look for when I'm blending in our Cuvée Lebec in our Barrel Select Cuvée, and I think that Barrel Select Cuvée is a great example of it. The last couple of years, we've really tried to up the Morved and the Cunwa, or I'm sorry, the Syrah, the Morved and Syrah on that wine, give it a darker kind of focus versus the Cuvée Lebec. Um, but I keep, you know, going back to that Grenache and, you know, it just provides this, you know, again, this lift to the wine um, that I think is so important in blending. So on to the varietal itself. Um, Grenache is a pretty widely planted grape out there. There is a lot of Grenache planted throughout the world, um, but not a lot of Grenache is made into varietal wine. Um, as I just said, a lot of it is used in blends and blends typically with uh, Syrah, Morvedra, other Rhone style grapes, but people can blend it um, with other things too. It's used with Tempranillo in Spain. It's used with um, other combinations of things um, throughout the world. Um, I believe I want to say it's like the third or fourth most widely planted red grape in the world. Um, most of that is in Europe still. Um, France and Spain have the most um, Grenache plantings of anywhere in the world, but it's really a truly Mediterranean grape. Find it in southern Italy, you can even actually have heard never tasted the wine, but find it in Northern Africa as well. So kind of circling that Mediterranean. Um, in the 1800s, um, some people left Europe and they left Europe and went to Australia and they left Europe and also went to California and they brought some Grenache cuttings with them to those places as well. Now in Australia, um, they use a lot of that for those GSM, those Grenache Syrah Morvedra wines. Um, but there are some great old vineyard, you know, vine Grenache wines that are coming out of Australia that you guys should take a look at it that, you know, are a part of my, um, I don't know, indoctrination or my learning about uh, Grenache and great Grenache wines um, throughout the world. Um, so definitely check those out at the McLaren Vale, out of Barossa, um, names like... Um, you know, Diarnberg is, is also um, has been a great example for me for a long time. They did this wine called, and probably still do, called the Custodian, uh, which I remember having several vintages many, many years ago and being blown away by those wines. So definitely check them out. Here in California, um, those initial plantings of Garage were primarily done in, in field blends. So they would just take all their cuttings, they might have been a bunch of different varieties and just planted them into a vineyard and some of those still exist out here um, in California, mostly in Northern California, in Mendocino, in Sonoma counties. Um, and actually Ridge has done uh, one of those old vine cuvées for a long time out of Linton Springs in Sonoma that you guys should check out. That was also a part of, of my learning. Now, Grenache historically in California has not been made into a Verado wines. Like other places, it's been made into blended wines like those field blends. There's also, um, there was also a guy named Steve Edmonds, Edmonds St. John Winery, if you've heard of them. Um, they did some Rome blends early and there was a guy named Randall Graham uh, from Bonnie Dune who was a you know probably the biggest proponent of these Rhone style blends and his uh, love for Rhone varieties and Grenache was really part of the reason why we're here um, and then a little bit closer to home uh, we have Tabas Creek obviously which I mentioned already um, doing those blends um, but the guy who really turned me towards making uh, more focused varietal wine is a guy named John Albin, who I mentioned before um, from Albin Vineyards up in Southern Slow County. And John has been a real integral part of the movement towards Rome varieties, but Grenache um, in particular. Um, 
and he was certainly influential. But honestly, the most influential thing to me and the decision for the winery here to plant Grenache was um, back in 1995, we set out, um, this is our second harvest here in the valley, and it was a real experimental time for the winery. So one of the varieties that we um, got lucky enough to play with was Grenache, and it came out of the Stoltman Vineyards, our neighbors out in Ballard Canyon. And um, that 95 Grenache um, was a really, and is a really special wine. I, I don't have a lot of it left. I think I might only have one or two bottles um, of it stashed somewhere. Um, but it really hit on what I think are the true, like, varietal characters of Grenache. And that's this sweet, you know, kind of bright red raspberry, strawberry fruit, um, along with a nice edge of pepper, this kind of white peppery quality to it. And it was really that wine that was a head turner for me um, to make the move and to commit to acreage of Grenache and planting Grenache and really started our pursuit of making Grenache as its own variety. Um, we uh, have another interesting story, it'll be short, but we didn't have a lot of distribution at that time in, in 1996, this probably would have been, but one of our first initial distributors who we actually no longer work with um, was a guy back east and um, he, I think we wound up making like 150 cases of that wine and his company, I believe, sold about 80 of those cases um, where it was labeled both vitamin G and the G spot by you know, people who work for him and were out there in the market. So it was really funny for me to go out and see a little shelf talker with Beckman Grenache um, and see the G-spot on it. Um, the guys, they sold like 80 or whatever cases. Um, I kind of figured we were onto something. They were really, you know, fine wine people. They um, dealt with fine wine places and these fine wine places and restaurants and stores were buying this wine and buying a lot of it. And uh, so we knew we were onto something really, really good. But it was John Albin who really pointed us and told me, actually not directly, but to a group of us, that you should really plant and take some of your best ground and plant it to Grenache. And so when we came around and bought Parisma, or what has become Parisma Mountain, and we started planting grapes, we knew Grenache was gonna be a part of that, and we took some of the best places, or what we thought were the best places, and we planted Grenache in those places along with our Syrah and all the other things that we grow out there. And so that was really our beginning um, of it. And a couple things to me that really stand out in Ballard Canyon, where Parisima is, and Los Olivos District as to why Grenache um, is so successful, and really it comes down to a lot is based on our weather here and our season. Grenache is a lover of a dry, warm climate, um, although it can get too warm for Grenache where um, it loses some structure, it loses some acid um, in the wine um, and makes kind of a more simpler wine than we're, we're looking to make as varietal wines of the Grenache. Um, and I think our weather and our long season are two things that really play into the success with Grenache, both in Ballard Canyon and in Los Olivos. So we have this very long season here, and Grenache is one of our earliest vines to wake up every year, um, and actually one of our latest vines, grapes, to pick and harvest every year. So it has a very, very long, long season. Um, and also something that really separates, you know, Ballard Canyon in general is the limestone. And limestone is so critical to making grape wine. And um, I think it really allows us to, um, you know, ripen these grapes very slowly. Um, and those limestone soils really provide freshness, vitality, and structure um, and acid um, that these wines, you know, truly meet, need to stand on their own. Um, so that's a bit about the history of it and um, why I think it, it ripens so well. Um, through the years, we've made um, a bunch of different Grenache wines, and um, now at Beckman, we currently make four different Grenache wines every year. Um, and in just in tasting and smelling through these three 2018 examples, um, they're all you know distinctly Grenache, but they're all distinctly a little bit different. They have some different complexities, some different uh, aroma, some different features, textures, 
um, structures to them that make them unique. And I'll get into that a little bit individually when we look um, at those wines. But it's just really, I don't know, cool. I think that we're able to make four different Grenache wines, three of which we're doing today. The other one, I guess I should mention, is the Block 8 Grenache, um, which has not been released yet from 2018, but look for that in the fall. Um, so to me, what I love about Grenache, and going back, back to that, is those, you know, the pleasure that it brings, the varietal character that I know we can hit. And so all three of these wines, I think, are made with the intent of expressing that varietal character. Um, and that is that, you know, red fruit dominated, spicy kind of quality that Grenache has. Um, and I think something else that I really love about Grenache that I didn't mention is texture. You know, texture is just so important to Grenache. Grenache has one of the smoothest, I don't know, I'd, I'd say in a way kind of seductive kind of quality. And I think it seduced me many, many years ago. Um, and it still seduces me every day. So. The three wines we have, we're gonna start with the San Inez Valley wine. The San Inez Valley wine, um, we've been actually making for a long time, but back in 2012, we had a little run in with the TTB and they figured out uh, that we weren't necessarily labeling our wines correctly, although I thought we were labeling them correctly. Um, so this wine has had two different names throughout the years, and actually we've reused the name now, again, not to get super confusing, um, to the Estate Grenache. But this wine was initially called Estate Grenache San Inez Valley. Uh, the TTB said that even though we own the vineyards, um, and this was now a blend of two different vineyards, which it is a blend of our two different vineyards, that we couldn't call it Estate anymore. Um, it's a long story, I don't need to get into it, but that wine has changed name thanks to the TTB and is now known as the San Inez Valley. And what we really shoot for in this wine is that very straightforward, very varietal driven quality, those things that I talked about initially, that raspberry fruit, that strawberry fruit, those should be sweet, they should be ripe, and they should be very apparent in this bottling of Grenache from Beckman. Now this bottling comes from the two different vineyards uh, that we own and it is primarily from Parisma Mountain so I'm going to bring up the Parisma Mountain map again so you guys can check it out um, the Parisma Mountain map of wines um, here this uh, color right here which I'm colorblind what color is that somebody help me out reddish reddish color good choice um, this reddish color is the Grenache blocks that we have planted throughout um, Parisma. And this wine predominantly comes from this block down here at the bottom of the vineyard. I guess I should bring it over a little bit more so it's in view. This is actually a, a section of Grenache that's planted to um, an Albin selection of Grenache. So these are cuttings we got uh, from the Albin vineyard. Um, but it also has a little bit of grapes that we sneak in from the Parisima section, which is a different selection or clone of Grenache uh, that we got from the Tablas Creek people. And then on the winery estate property, the Thomas and Judith Beckman property, the original block of Grenache is planted here. Um, you can see kind of the tasting room where we are and the winery buildings here. So on the southern side of the property um, is planted to this. And this was made with cuttings that we took out of the Parisima Mountain Grenache um, block on Parisima. Um, it's actually grafted to a Merlot um, and actually is the source now of the third wine entirely in the lineup, the Estate Grenache. So this San Inez has all that Albin section in block three from the bottom of Parisima. And it has a little bit of the Parisima wine in there. And it also has a little bit of the estate wine in there as well. Um, and again, I think what, what I'm looking for when I'm making this wine is just that expression of that pure Grenache fruit and flavor. Um, so we use that idea when we're making in our decisions on the wine. So that would be in harvesting and through our fermentation the choice to whether de-stem these grapes or to not, or to leave whole clusters in there, all of those things. So for this wine, um, taken out of those blocks, um, picked, I would say, in the latter part of October into the beginning of November, 
in 2018. Um, we chose to choose to de-stem all this fruit. So we will just have a lot of whole berries, a lot of crushed berries in the fermenter. Um, and then we'll do a long cold soak on this wine. Grenache is not a very dark grape. Um, it does have a lot of tannins to it sometime, but not a lot of color to it. And so that cold soaking really allows that, that color to extract and to stabilize um, in the wine. So we'll cold soak these for anywhere from as little as four days to as much as seven days. Um, the fermentation on all of these wines is all done with a natural or native ferment. So we're not inoculating or adding yeast to these wines. Um, and that is true for all three of them. With this particular wine, it's typically fermented in smaller vessels than the two other wines um, that I'll get into in a minute. Um, these are smaller tanks. They're ton and a half to three ton fermenters. And it seems like a really good size for this particular wine and the style that we're looking to make out of it. Now, as you reach for this wine, what you're gonna notice initially is just fruit. It really comes out of the glass. It's, it's sweet, it's ripe, it's bright, and has all of those flavors of aromas of raw, ber uh, raw berries, strawberries, and raspberries to it. I kind of combined them there, raw berries. I, I kind of like it. Um, and also a little bit of spice to it as well. But this wine typically, and the way it's evolved, has really become a real fruit bomb of a Grenache, right? It's just really all about that ripe, you know, sweet red fruits. So let me go ahead and give it a little taste. Mm. And again, that aroma is coming through again on the palate where you just have tons of tons of sweet fruit, sweet berries on there. Um, it does have some nice fine tannins. Um, and what keeps all of these wines together is some decent level of acidity. Now, in 2018, we were really blessed with having really ideal conditions, um, conditions where we can let the grapes hang out there, ripen very slowly, and retain some really beautiful natural acidity to the wine. Um, this wine of the three, for me, stylistically is meant to drink younger, right? This is a wine that's pretty upfront. It's pretty in your face. Um, it does have some structure and it does have the ability to age a little bit. But I think for me, drinking it for its primary fruit is really what we're all about and what we're after here. And so I would encourage people to drink this wine younger. So I would say within the first five to probably seven years of its life. In order to preserve all that freshness and fruit, um, we age all this wine in neutral barrels, and we typically use a slightly larger barrel for this, um, and I think I might have touched on it in the last thing. Anyway, we age wines in 60-gallon barrels up to 132-gallon barrels, um, and all of them are a little bit different. And Grenache is a really uh, fun way because each of these three wines has a nice mix of, you know, kind of the smaller to medium-sized barrels, the 60 to 80-sized gallon gallon barrels here and this last wine when we get into that is going to be on those 132 gallon um, barrels that we age it in so again just looking for that, that that ripeness that that you know voluptuousness those things that are really um, what I truly think and love about Grenache are um, and in order to achieve those things you need to make you know a wine that's fairly ripe um, so these wines also carry some, you know, pretty decent alcohols to them and, as well. And I guess I could touch on that really quickly in that, I mean, to me, great Grenache needs to have some alcohol to it. It really is a grape that is slow to ripen phenolically. So sometimes the sugar, you know, can be a little bit ahead of the flavor when you're ripening Grenache on the vine. And it really requires an, an enormous amount of patience um, on the vine. One, it's, it's just a very late kind of color. It just, it doesn't color as early as a lot of other varieties, but that color can come later um, as it builds more sugar and the bricks get higher and higher. And also flavorly, you know, you get more depth and richness as you let the wine hang, uh, the vine, uh, the grapes, I should say, hang out on the vine a little bit longer. So you'll see that in all three of these wines. And the biggest difference between these wines is one, the different parts of the vineyard or different blends of the parts of the vineyard that they come out of. And then also some of the techniques that we use uh, when we're crafting these three different wines. So that is the San Inez. 
2018, and it's a mouthful of yummy berries, and I hope you guys enjoy that. So moving on to the Parisima Mountain wine. Uh, the Parisima Mountain wine is a little bit different, and it comes out of a different section of the vineyard, and I think I pointed it out, or you saw it before, but it's really coming out of this small area here. And it is about, I don't know, I'd say two and a half to three acre block or so of Grenache um, that has really always stood out to us. We've started making a bottling um, of these grapes since 1999. Actually, our first crop, our first vintage ever was with Grenache. Um, we had a little bit of Syrah that year too off of this block. And, and there's something just uniquely special about the block. I think you can see when, when I have all three of these glasses in front of me that one, the color is just slightly deeper um, in this particular wine. And that's because the grapes themselves come in and they just are a little bit darker uh, than some of our other Grenache um, grapes. Now, for years and years and years, and actually the initial years in making these wines, we actually blended quite a bit of Syrah, um, or maybe not quite a bit, but anywhere from like 10 to 12, um, maybe even up to 20% on a given vintage. Um, and those young vines, I think, uh, we felt really needed that, you know, addition of Syrah, not only for color, but to bolster some body and to provide an additional kind of tannic backbone and structure to the wine. Now, as the wine, the vines have aged more and more, um, we really started to back off of that use of Syrah. So the last several vintages of this wine have just been pure 100% Grenaches rather than that blending with a little bit of Syrah in there. And the other huge kind of change that we did in this wine over the last couple of years is to gear it stylistically a little bit more towards our whole cluster wine, or our, I guess our former whole cluster wine, since we're not actually producing that wine anymore. That wine is all being made into this wine um, now, the Parisima Mountain Syrah. So we use about a third or so whole clusters when we're fermenting this. So we'll take the two thirds, do our normal destemming and sorting of those grapes, then we'll just take clusters and we'll chuck them into the fermenter. Um, not chuck them, but you know what I mean, put them into the fermenter um, and ferment the destem fruit along with the whole cluster of fruit. Now, there's a lot of ways I can go about this story um, at this point. Um, I can get into our vast history of using whole clusters and our, our history of whole cluster fermentation. I've got a fruit fly bothering me. Goes back um, all the way to 2002, kind of the same time I started biodynamic farming um, out there on Parisima. Uh, we started to experiment with whole cluster and, and I don't know, you guys might not know me too well. Some people know me well. The, you know, when I go for something, I tend to go for it full bore and sometimes that's good and sometimes that bad. In the case of the 2002 whole cluster Grenache, which was never bottled, you can guess just because it was never bottled that it wasn't maybe my greatest success for you, but it did add an integral part of the Cuvée Le Bec in 2002, which was a hugely successful Cuvée Le Bec in 2002. Um, so we've been experimenting and playing along with these whole cluster ideas for a long time. And I think over years, we really settled on that third percent, 30 percent, 33 percent whole clusters as being a perfect balance between the pursuit of making that pure Grenache, that, that you know, fruity fruit bomb, more like what we get in the uh, San Inez, um, but combining it with some of the more savory qualities that you can get and spice driven qualities you can, you can get out of the, the grape when you start to in increase or use or utilize some of these whole clusters in there. So the first thing you're going to smell is that, you know, the wine's a little bit different. You know, you definitely get that fruit core and I think we get that fruit component in all three of those, these wines. But what you're getting here is that just this added layer um, of something different, something, you know, unique that's, that's, you know, really coming from that uh, fermentation with the whole clusters. So it might be a spice characteristic. Uh, to me, it adds like a bit of a savory component um, to the wine. So it's not just full bore fruit, but it's kind of this cool combination of sweet fruit and savory into one wine. And then I think as I get it into the mouth and you get it into your mouth, texturally, you can really see where that whole cluster is coming through. So I'm going to take a sip just to make sure I still get it. And first off, the wine really attacks your palate. 
you know, very different from the estate, the San Inez wine. The San Inez wine is just up front, it's in your face. This wine, you know, it's kind of mellow on entry and then it kind of bursts through the mid palate and on the back end. And I think you'll see texturally in there that the wine has a little bit, actually quite a bit different feel to it um, than the San Inez wine. Now that feel, that kind of broadening um, of the palate is one, not only the grapes that we use are a little bit different and make a little bit broad, but it is definitely the inclusion of these whole clusters and the stems and what they do to kind of broaden the mouthfeel and kind of change the chemistry of the wine. Now, when you use stems in a wine, you're actually using something that has a lot of potassium in it. And that potassium is actually going to raise your pH level, not to get too techno geeky out for you guys, but that raised little pH level is going to give you that broader kind of feeling as it as it flows across you know your mouth both this way from front to back and then sideways um, so you're definitely getting that broad expansion of the wine both ways this way and that way and I think that's really critical um, part of it and also to me you know it's changed the tannin profile of the wine a little bit um, this wine has a bit more tannin to it than the San Inez wine to me um, not that they're firmer or harder or drier, they're just a little bit bigger and more present. And what they really do here is they take the wine and they really extend that flavor on the back end. So that combination of that whole clusters, the combination of the grapes being a little bit different, a little bit different clone, having themselves more structure and tannins to them and a little bit more acidity to them than the grapes we use in the San Inez bottling really differentiates the wines too. Now with this wine and the last wine, we're gonna be moving away from the smaller 60 gallon barrels and 80 gallon barrels into more 80 gallon barrels up to 132 gallon barrels. And again, what we're doing there is doing the same thing. We're taking that wine and really kind of broadening it out across the palate by using these larger aging vessels. And what's great about these larger aging vessels is exactly that. They, they have this lower surface area of wood, of the oak to the wine. So if you're in a 60 gallon barrel, you have, you know, a lot of surface area of wine to wood. But as we move into this wine in 80 and 132s, and then to this wine all in the 132s, you're going to see that as the wines grow into a larger vessel that they too kind of broaden um, and, and expand um, across your palate as well. So this wine, um, again, compared to the San Inez, um, should age a little bit longer and actually should and needs to be aged a little bit longer. So um, I poured this about roughly 20 to 30 minutes prior to doing this tasting. And now after I've been on it for 30 minutes, it's been about an hour. Um, so it has had a little bit of time to open up, but it still retains some tightness. It still retains some tannins, which are great, which are great for the longevity of this wine. Now we have vintages of Parisma going back all the way to 1999. And I would say just about all of them, give or take a winemaking error or two, have all aged tremendously well and continue to drink tremendously well. And we actually have a couple of them currently for sale. So you can hit up Neil for the 2000, which is a really fun um, old you know, example of Grenache and some more recent ones in 08 and 11. So definitely if you like or think you might like an aged Grenache, um, definitely hit Neil up for those. So that's kind of the story with the Parisma wine. Um, it is, you know, to me, I don't know, not to take anything away, and I hate to do this because all these mines are my children, but to me it's probably the best example of a Grenache that we make um, every year, uh, consistently, um, year in and year out, that block just delivers, you know, really, really high quality and makes it consistently styled um, and I think very e uh, excellent wine almost every year. The thing that holds Grenache back from being our, our number one player is just that. It's just not quite as consistent as the Syrah that we make, um, but it's a very, very close second um, to me in quality. Okay, so moving on to the third wine, which is the San Inez. Oh no, sorry, it's not the San Inez. That's the San Inez. This is the Ballard Canyon, and this one is the Los Olivos District. So um, kind of to take the place of what we had and the whole cluster and kind of 
relive the old estate Grenache wine, we decided to start bottling this wine, um, which honestly has been really worthy of bottling it by itself for many, many years. Um, it's a really interesting block. I'm just gonna go back to, this, to the map a little bit, and just point out again where it is. Um, here it says San Inez, it says Cuvée Lebec. You might not be able to read that, but I can. Um, but now it is the source, and we need to update this map of this Estate Los Olivos wine. This is actually our oldest block of Grenache that we have planted out of both vineyards. Uh, this was a vineyard block that was initially planted to Merlot, um, and there actually still is a little bit of Merlot in this block. Um, but we kind of quickly moved away from Merlot there for a number of different reasons, although we do like this little bit of Merlot that blends into our Cabernet Sauvignon that's still out there. This block was planted in 1995 and then grafted in 1998 over to Grenache, or actually, I'm sorry, 1999 over to Grenache, or was it 2000? I, I can't remember. Anyway, somewhere around there, we grafted it over. So it's, it's actually kind of a unique wine in that when you, when you graft a plant, when you graft a grapevine, we actually are grafting onto the Merlot variety. So these vines out here have a rootstock that's called 3309 that grows underground. And then they have a little portion of Merlot still on them. And then the fruiting part, the top part of the plant above the graft is where the Grenache was grafted onto it. So interestingly enough, and when I go through that block, I do kind of notice a couple of Merlot vines out there still. So those find their way into the wine, but it's just a couple. But I think the Merlot part is actually changing um, the clusters and the, the the little bit in this block. And whereas in the original Parisima Mountain block that makes the Parisima Mountain wine, we tend to get, you know, pretty tight, um, well set, fairly small Grenache bunches. Um, and what's different about this block with the Merlot in there is that Merlot typically sets a longer, looser cluster. And I think that we've seen that this Grenache cluster kind of is a little bit longer and is a little bit looser than our Grenache that's not grafted onto a Merlot. And I think the Merlot, I can't really say this scientifically for sure 100%, but I do think that Merlot is having an impact on how the clusters look and appear. So this is a looser set um, that we have and a looser bunch of Grenache, which is actually really beneficial for Grenache and something I didn't get into when I talked about Grenache was the growing of it. Um, but I could get totally sidetracked for a whole nother hour when we, when we start talking about the growing of Grenache um, and our evolution of the growing of the Grenache. But I think it does have an impact on, you know, for sure the, the, the style of wine and the quality of the wine and really the expression of the wine that we get. So this wine, the estate Los Olivos, is made similar to the San Inez in that this is all from de-stemmed grapes. So the only one that we actually use stems and whole cluster is on is the Purisma Mountain. Excuse me, need a little water. So this wine in Los Olivos district ripens a little bit earlier than the two wines um, off of Parisma Mountain. Um, I'd say that typically the Parisma Mountain Grenache is really the one that we actually start our Grenache harvest with um, on Parisma, and the San Inez is picked a little bit later than that. But prior to that, maybe about five days to seven days, maybe even eight to 10 on a vintage, we're picking grapes um, here at the Thomas and Judith Beckman Vineyard, the estate vineyard, um, prior to picking uh, over on Parisima. So it is a little bit warmer here um, than it is on Parisima. And it does have a little bit different soil. Um, it doesn't have as much of the limestone influence as we have um, on Parisima, um, but it has this really well-drained, kind of rocky, gravelly soil of which there are some limestone particles in it. Um, and really, I think because of that, it's a little bit warmer here, and because it's on a little bit warmer, kind of well-drained soil, it ripens just a little bit quicker um, than it does. So this wine is typically made off of one pick. It's made in one tank. Um, we typically ferment, no, not typically, we always ferment this in the same tank every year. Um, it's really built off that one pick and that one tank 
every year. So it's really important for us to pay a lot of attention to it because um, a lot of our wines are made from a lot of different vats and a lot of different picks. Actually, most of them are. Um, this is one of the few, along with actually the Parisima and like the Clone One Syrah that are made from just one pick. I guess the Block 8 is pretty much one pick as well, but sometimes it's two. Um, but this is one pick, one fermenter. And we found these, I don't know, stumbled upon, luckily, these six ton fermenters are these big wide uh, fermenters that really are, are just ideal Grenache fermenters um, and why they're ideal I think is that they really spread the grapes out um, and they have kind of a smaller cap so when you ferment you know these grapes and these vats you got the juice on the bottom and all the co2 that's pushing the grapes to the top and making these you know thick caps on top that we go through and we punch down um, and mix and that's how we extract our flavor out of there but these six ton fermenters really spread this cap out and we get a kind of a gentler extraction um, out of it than we do in a smaller tank or wine a tank that's more vertical that has a deeper cap out of it. Um, it's really, I don't know, lucky that we stumbled upon these these tanks because I think they're a big part in making both of these last two wines that we're talking about. Um, then once it's you know fermented natively like the other two, um, cold soaked, all those things I talked about, this wine is all aged now in these punch-in barrels, these 132 gallon, these larger barrels. And actually there is a little bit of new barrel on this wine, but when you're using a new barrel and it's a 132 size gallon barrel, you know, that new wood, that toast to, you know, wine, you know, ratio is, is much lower than it is in a smaller barrel that we would use on, let's say a Syrah or a Cabernet. And so you don't get as much of that, you know, oaky quality. Um, and then we found this barrel, I don't know, a decade more ago, that just hit on these wonderful Grenache, you know, kind of spice characteristics. And Grenache can be peppery, um, like maybe you get a little bit more in the Parisma wine, um, but it can also be like baker spicy, like have like, you know, cinnamon and nutmeg and clove and all these wonderful, you know, secondary and tertiary aromas and flavors. And this barrel kind of had that similar profile. And so decided many, many years ago to start in integrating it into the program, into the Cuvée Labac, because these, these wines are primarily made in the more neutral barrel. But I just, we decided to start using it into this wine. And I think you get it aromatically in this wine, where you pick up, yes, it has that, you know, that ripe fruit, that, that raspberry, that strawberry character that is, you know, inherent and so a part of Grenache. But what you get is that little bit of nutmeg and, and cinnamon and clove that comes off aromatically in the wine. Thirsty. Great. And I think it really adds texturally to the wine as well. Um, this wine to me is kind of the, the, the biggest, let's say, of the three. I mean, in my opinion, and I think, you know, it's a little bit riper than the other two wines. It's, it's from, again, a, a warmer place. The acidity is just slightly lower than it is on these two wines. And so it has this very broad kind of rich, you know, mouth filling quality to it. I'm very expansive and expressive on the back end. So that integration of the barrel in the wine, along with the neutral punchins that we use, um, is really coming through on this wine. Um, to me, out, out of these three, kind of, you know, interestingly enough, you know, has like the smoothest kind of tannin profile uh, of all three. And I think that that little bit of new wood that we use in there, that 15 to 20%, the punch-ins also are really just, you know, smoothing and rounding the wine out um, and helping to lengthen the back end of it a little bit. So here we kind of use those stems with that same kind of focus to give it like, you know, a little bit more complexity and a little bit more diversity to its flavor profile. And here maybe it's that little bit of barrel, that punch in barrel, the bigger barrel um, that's adding to more complexity, richness, length to the wine. So um, 
just to you know go through and i can't believe i've been talking for 45 minutes already time just so flies but it's just so fun to go back and forth to go back you know and smell you know the san inez and then just pick up maybe those subtle you know differences those nuances that come through with the different techniques and the different blocks um, that we use to grow and ferment and age um, these wines in so definitely you know picking up that little bit of spice quality that that character along with the fruit whereas this one if i go back to it you know just has that you know that in your face just ripe sweet fruit quality to it um, and then you go back to the parisima and you have like this you know, this different quality, this like, um, you know, again, kind of savory, you know, quality that meshes with its, its sweet um, red fruits. So um, that's my tasting through the wines. And I don't know if there's any questions out there, but um, I do have a couple of questions here. And one of the questions that we get from a lot of people are food pairings and food pairings with Grenache. Um, you know, to me, you know, the San Inez, you know, grilled foods for sure you know pizzas and pastas for sure barbecue for sure all those things are are fantastic with the san inez wine for these two wines i'm thinking you know more in the the roasted um and braised kind of meats um for these so if you you do like you know some braised you know game or some you know braised lamb or or something like that these would be maybe some some pork you know shank or something like that veal shank would be beef shank would be ideal um, for these two wines for sure um, i think that um, again they have versatility you know they they drink well on their own you don't need to pair them with anything but they definitely will you know pair extremely well and I must say that one of my favorite pairings with these two wines is cassoulet and I just am a huge cassoulet fan um, and so this wine just fits so perfectly these wines with with that cassoulet profile um, I know it's a it's a long and arduous process to make a cassoulet um, I typically don't and we typically don't make much cassoulet at home and if we do it would be a very scaled down quick kind of version of it but you know, um, I'm thinking of this Parisian restaurant that I, I've been to many, many times. It has the most delicious cassoulet in the world. And, and I wish I had a bottle of these Grenache wines there to have with me, but I didn't at the time. I drank something else. So that, that to me is like perfect food pairing wine for these. Um, Taylor, do we have any other prompts for questions for me? Uh, good question, Timothy. Block eight, yes, block eight is its kind of own monster. Um, it is probably the most tannic of the Grenaches that we make. Um, that's why it's not released yet. It was actually just recently bottled and we've moved the kind of bottling um, to it. Um, but I would fit the block eight probably in here. You know, if I was gonna do a tasting lineup, I would put it after the San Inez, but before the Paris, excuse me, the Parisma and the Los Olivos estate. Um, it is definitely a fruit driven wine for sure. Um, it is an all D stem wine. It's made more like the San Inez, but it has this firmness and I, I'm not sure what gives it the firmness um, when compared, you know, to these two wines, which are basically made from the same cuttings. So the Block 8, the Parisima, and the, San, the Los Olivos estate are all made from the same original cuttings, the cuttings that come out of this wine, the Parisima block. Um, what's different about the Block 8 is that it's own rooted. So it's just the Grenache roots and plant above and below ground, which you know probably has a big impact on it. The other big thing about Grenache Block 8 that differentiates from these wines more into the growing as they're grown in a head train style. They're grown very low to the ground. These wines are all grown in a trellis, which is, you know, the fruit zone is probably three, four feet above the ground. For the Block 8, you know, that fruit zone is probably 12 to 18 inches off the ground. So it could be that closeness to the ground, that own rooted that really sets the block eight apart from these wines, but I would put it, you know, kind of right in here 
Um, definitely fruit driven, definitely spicy, but with that more structured kind of tannic backbone, but maybe not as big and kind of broad on the palate as the Los Olivos estate and the Parisima mountain. So anyway, thanks for the question. Really good question. How do you decide to use cork versus screw cap? I had a feeling that this one was kind of come up because here we have one screw cap wine and two cork wine. So, I mean, there's a, a, a bunch of different, uh, different decisions that come into whether we use a screw cap or not. I'm, I'm a huge fan of screw caps. I, I think that any of these wines could be bottled with a screw cap um, and maybe ultimately they all should. Um, but for right now, our take on it is that the screw cap wines are really meant for the younger drinking wines. So the wines like the San Inez Estate and even the Cuvée Le Bec, which is also our other red that's bottled in screw cap along with the Rosé, the Sauvignon Blanc and the whites that we do it, you know, really should be drank, you know, younger. They're really for our more closure for our more younger drinking wines that we think should be more embraced for their youth and their freshness and their fruit. Um, so that's the main decision um, in going to it. Now, these wines, you know, to me, and I'm a bit of a traditionalist in some way, the cork is the real traditional way to age um, and store wines in bottle. Um, there is, um, you know, a difference between a cork and a screw cap. A screw cap is a more sealed closure. There's less oxygen, although there is some um, oxygen aging that goes on into a screw cap finish wine, not as much as we have in cork finish wines. And I think the structure, the tannins, the evolution, the ageability of these last two wines really is what drives me to bottle them under a cork closure versus a screw cap. Awesome. Another one coming from Vince. Vince. Can you comment on the Grenache Rosé versus the Grenache Red Wines? I mean, I sure can because I just love to talk about Grenache more and more. Um, you know, the Rosé is, is actually grown in a, an entirely different block than these wines um, come from. It's a block on Parisima that is, again, it's another grafted block, but this time it's Grenache is grafted onto an older Syrah block um, that just maybe wasn't making the cut for the Syrah program and we needed some more Grenache so we did the quick thing and grafted some some rosé on uh, some Grenache onto it. Um, it's a different selection than we use um, clone or selection and I can get into clones and selection if anybody's interested. Taylor's shaking her head like no don't even go there which I agree kind of a boring subject honestly. The rosé is coming out of the heart of uh, Parisma Mountain here. It's, uh, um, it's a Grenache selection or clone that's called 362. There's a lot of debate in the industry about 362. Is it real 362? Is it not real 362? Not like you guys care what real 362 is. Um, but let me tell you that th this block makes better rosé wine than it does red wine, and so that's why it's chosen. But the big difference between a red wine Grenache and a rosé is really, honestly, one, how it's made, but it's really the picking decisions that go into it. So when we make a decision to pick red wine versus rosé, it's, it's quite different. So for the rosé, we're looking for a lower alcohol. We're actually looking for a slightly different flavor profile than what we're looking for in the red wines. And if you pick Grenache earlier at a lower sugar, at a lower potential alcohol number, you're going to wine that a wine that has a different flavor profile than these wines do. You're going to get some of that strawberry, but it's not going to be as rich. But you're also going to get things like watermelon. You're going to get some actually white wine, some citrus quality out of the fruit. So those are more the flavor profile that we're looking Looking for when we make those decisions to pick rosé and then the biggest difference is you know it's made as rosé and not as red wine so skin contact that's the huge difference here these wines are made and fermented on their skins that's how we get the color the flavor the extraction the tannins out of it the rosé is made with very little skin contact it's made actually more like a white wine where we take the juice after a short skin contact and ferment it in tank primarily or barrel um, and ball it much, much sooner. So the rosés are, you know, aged four to five months at most. These wines are aged, you know, a year, almost a year on the San Inez and then up to about 18 months on the Parisima and the San Inez, uh, the Los Olivos estate wine. So anyway, good question. So we're hitting 55 minutes, I've been just told. 
That means we got to start wrapping it up because from we, what we learned last time, Instagram doesn't let you go over an hour. So um, if there's anything other that I can touch on, I would just say this, and that would be um, our next tasting. Our next virtual tasting, which is gonna be coming up in a week. We're not gonna actually have a virtual pack like we've had the last two times. So for the white wine, we had a white wine pack. For the Grenache, we had a Grenache pack. But what we're gonna do is talk about a couple of Syrah wines that we just released for the wine club. So this last wine club shipment, quarter two, spring shipment, had both the 2018 Parisima Mountain Syrah in it and also the Parisima Mountain Syrah Clone One. So that's gonna be our focus. We're gonna do it a week from now. We're going to do it a week from today, Friday, um, 5 o'clock. So I will see you guys hopefully um, in a week from now. You'll get some prompts. You'll get some reminders about it. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed this second installment, this second edition of our virtual wine tasting from Beckman Vineyards. We're going to say goodbye now, and we'll see you next week.